Werf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Swerf Buffy Bocconi webinar on the November 2022 ECB FSR, which was just released this morning. We are happy and honored to have two leading thinkers and authors of the ECB's FSR with us today to present key findings. John Fell, Deputy Director General, Macro Pro and Financial Stability at the ECB, and Tamara Shakir, Deputy Head of Division, Systemic Risks and Financial Institutions, also at the ECB. And if this were not enough, uh, we even have the great privilege uh, to have Laurent Clerc, Director for Research at the Autorité de Contrôle Prudentiel et de Résolution in France as discussant. Without further ado, John and Tamara, over to you. So, uh, thanks a lot, Ernest, and uh, <clears throat> on behalf of myself and, and Tamara, uh, let me thank you and, and the SWERF board uh, for inviting us back yet again. I mean, yeah, we really feel honored to be invited to share our financial stability analysis in this forum twice a year. And uh, I mean, while you alluded to it a bit in your opening remarks, uh, Ernest, I mean, perhaps it's self-evident, but the FSR, I mean, it really represents a collective effort across the euro system many business areas of the of the ecb beyond our own are involved in in, in preparing the drafts and it profits from discussions in our financial stability committee which is a gathering of the heads of all of the financial stability departments across all of the euro area national central banks and it's also discussed in the ecb uh, governing council so it, it, it really reflects the unique insights uh, of governors um, as well now, I'm going to run through some of the sources of risks and vulnerabilities that we're highlighting this time, and then I'm going to pass to Tamara, who will also uh, provide you with a, with a quick overview of, uh, of, of the special feature articles that we have included uh, in this issue. So if we go to the next slide and let me get, you know, cut, cut to the chase and start with the bad news. Uh, the is this issue of the FSR uh, marks the second successive downgrade of our financial stability assessment. I think it, it might be hard to believe, but just 12 months ago, uh, when the worst of the pandemic seemed to be behind us, um, we were cautiously upgrading our, our outlook. I, I don't know if you remember that, but many gauges of financial system soundness had either reached or were approaching uh, pre-pandemic levels at that time. And with this, the paradigm of low for long, hunt for yield and liquidity abundance, uh, which had really dominated our, our, our pre-pandemic thinking on financial stability risks, had made a comeback. Uh, now, while it might go too far to say that the core narrative of our assessment now is one of an unraveling um, of that uh, um, of that paradigm, um, it certainly seems as if it is being tested now. Now, as we know uh, too well, the Russian invasion of Ukraine unleashed a new supply side shock just as the impact of the pandemic was subsiding. Now, with central banks across the major advanced economies acting to rein in inflation. Um, we see financial conditions are tightening and pre-existing vulnerabilities are being exposed. Now, before the invasion, you may recall that we had warned in earlier issues of the FSR that the prevailing constellation of vulnerabilities made a supply side shock um, the, most, the, the, the most dangerous uh, for, for, for financial stability in whatever form it took. Now, that was because of its potential to widen the differential between expected interest rates and growth. So the OR and the G inputs that commonly go into, uh, you know, equations for valuing assets are, are, are assessing debt sustainability. And as the, that differential has widened, not only are asset price uh, misalignments being exposed, but with corporate profitability also coming under pressure, they're, they're actually being enlarged. Now, our market intelligence indicates that sentiment has soured um, a year ago the Cassandrans, uh, so the pessimists, were in the minority. Now it's the Panglossians, the optimists. So, and symptoms of this pessimism can be seen uh, in lower market liquidity, higher asset price volatility, and investors uh, pulling back from their exposures to investment funds. So far, uh, the adjustment has been orderly and it seems confined uh, to an orderly retreat of non bank financing. But the vulnerabilities and amplifiers that we're seeing now are, are the very same ones which underpinned uh, the March 2020 uh, market turbulence uh, that we spoke about in this group 
some time ago. Now, at the same time, recession risk is rising, and for the euro area, recession could expose sovereign vulnerabilities and put greater market focus on budget constraints. Now, before I show some of the evidence and analysis behind our assessment, I think it's worth remarking uh, that the banking sector is actually not front and centre in our narrative this time. For now, our assessment is that financial stability is being supported by the resilience of banks, but, and there's always a but, asset quality challenges down the road uh, can't be excluded. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, the sources of inflation, uh, inflationary pressures in major advanced economies are, are, of course, well known. And I don't think uh, they need explaining here. But as inflation has risen, uh, the normalization of monetary policy stances has led uh, to a tightening of financial conditions. And that's more so for the euro area uh, than for the US, as you can see on the chart on the left there. Now, this together with the sustained rise of energy costs has produced a more pessimistic outlook. I'm not sure if you had a chance to look, but both the recently published IMF WIO and the GFSR had remarkably gloomy opening sentences in their forewords that spoke of storm clouds, uh, alluding to heightened global recession and, and financial stability risks. And this can be seen uh, in a more marked rise of one year ahead recession probabilities produced by, by Bloomberg for the euro area <clears throat> than is the case for the US. Now, when our May episode was published, both stood at around 30%. You can see that there on the chart on the right. But in just six months, uh, the euro area figure has now jumped up to 80%. Uh, while the US figure is a bit lower, but it's, it, it, you can see that it has also risen sharply as well. Now, if we go to the next slide, uh, two year ahead inflation expectations for the euro area rose above 2% towards the end of last year. And as they did, uh, uncertainty rose about the future path of euro area short term interest rates. And you can see that there on the left, the yellow dots are highlighting the period uh, when inflation expectations were higher. Now, a similar pattern was also was also evident in, in the US data more or less at the same time. And as you can see on the right, uh, that rise of risk premium together with rising inflation expectations triggered uh, so simultaneous and sizable declines of both global bond and stock prices. Uh, if you just look back compared to their, their respective peaks, uh, global bond prices are now down 20%, uh, while equities are down 25%. Now, stock, market, stock price corrections of this magnitude are actually not uncommon. Uh, you're just looking at the euro area data for the past 25 years. Uh, we have seen three declines of this magnitude uh, in that period. But corporate bond returns were never negative, or bond returns were ne never negative at the same time the stocks had fallen, except for this year. And that means that there will be few investors which, who will have managed uh, to avoid large losses. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, as market sentiment soured, uh, primary market issuance by euro area corporations has been severely cut back this year. And that's the case both in bond and in equity markets. For equities, there's been a drought of IPOs this year, and that's true both in the US um, and in the euro area, uh, with more than half of the initially planned offerings being withdrawn, cancelled. And uh, now market intelligence suggests uh, that both demand and supply side factors uh, have been at play here uh, with uh, lowered risk appetite holding invest investors back uh, while issuers seem to be waiting for calmer market conditions and of course for better prices. Now for the corporate bond markets these factors are important too but here we also see some evidence of substitution of funding sources uh, from markets to banks. Now, we've heard that borrowing from banks has become relatively cheaper uh, for some issuers, and that's because lending rates uh, can, be, can be slower uh, to reflect higher, uh, higher central bank interest rates uh, and market interest rates than market rates do. Now, if non-bank finance is indeed retreating, uh, this will aggravate uh, market liquidity risks and unexpectedly large uh, margin calls, as we saw earlier in this year uh, in the ed energy markets. And that could even trigger uh, the sort of dash for cash dynamics that we witnessed at the outbreak of the pandemic. So going back again to March 2020. Now, with those vulnerabilities, if, 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 asset, price, if asset prices had reached levels that were close to their intrinsic values, we wouldn't maybe be too alarmed about those vulnerabilities. But we do think uh, that notwithstanding the large scale of adjustment of asset prices that we've already seen, uh, further declines 
are still possible. Uh, markets seem optimistic about the fundamentals uh, are priced uh, for optimistic developments, including for the path of interest rates and also uh, US stock price valuations. They actually still remain well above uh, pre Lehman levels, after which, of course, we, we saw a substantial decline. Now, if we go to the next slide, and as I said, as I said at the start, we've uh, <clears throat> we have been seeing investors cutting back on their exposures to investment funds since the start of the year. Outflows have been broad based across the risky asset spectrum, and they've been sizable. Uh, there's just one example. Uh, one, one example is for high yield corporate bond funds. The cumulative outflows year to date has reached around 15% of total assets. So the total assets that were outstanding at the end of last year, 15%. That is value adjusted. So it's not the fall in asset prices, but the quantity uh, of, of, of funds in those, in those funds that has come back. And that's larger uh, than the 12% outflow uh, that we witnessed in March 2020. It's attracted less attention uh, because it has been uh, far more orderly uh, than was the case in, in March 2020. Now, as you can see on the left, as these funds, uh, the investment funds lose, lose investors and as, as, as those funds come out of those funds, this has led to selling uh, of the riskiest corporate and sovereign bonds uh, by the investment fund sector. Now, retreating non-bank finance, of course, also diminishes the capacity of the, of, of the investment fund sector uh, to fund businesses and sovereigns. Uh, but it also provides scope for banks to claw back uh, market share that they lost uh, as those markets grew, especially the credit markets. And on the positive side, it appears uh, de-risking by investment funds has marginally improved uh, their cash buffers, uh, which you can see there. You can see that there on the right, uh, the blue line. Uh, and that, of course, when the cash buffers are higher and when those funds are faced with demands uh, from, from investors, uh, they will more easily be able to meet those redemptions with cash rather than having to sell assets and possibly even, you know, creating risks of fire sales. Now, if I go to the next slide uh, and sovereign vulnerabilities, these have risen uh, in view of ongoing fiscal support to cushion the impact of higher energy prices and also uh, the weaker economic outlook. Of course, the concern is that higher deficits together with rising funding costs may not only limit the fiscal space to shelter the economy, uh, from future shocks, but it could also put debt dynamics on a less favorable trajectory, especially in countries with higher levels of debt. Now, while we did see some market pressures and sovereign spreads in a number of countries since the last, last FSR, these have stabilized recently, and that's, that, that's thanks in part to uh, the reinvestment flexibility uh, under the PEP and the announcement of the transmission protection instrument. Uh, in July. You can see on the right there, pressures on spreads uh, eased after the TPI was unveiled. Now, if we go to the next slide, and Euro area firms, high inflation and energy prices, recession risks, and tighter financial conditions are all posing challenges uh, for non-financial firms. On aggregate, uh, in the first half of, uh, of this year, Euro area corporates had actually managed to bring their profitability back to and even above uh, pre-pandemic levels. And this was because firms were able to pass on higher input prices to customers, and of course, economic activity was still relatively strong. However, growing margin pressures and a weaker economic outlook have markedly lowered uh, corporate earnings expectations. Uh, and as seen on the left, in real terms, uh, they've even turned negative. It also, you can see also on that chart that real earnings recessions don't occur very frequently. Uh, so, needless to say, that is causing indicators of credit risk to rise. Uh, so, the likelihood that the firms will not be able to repay their debts. The chart on the right uh, compares the latest expected default rates at the euro area sectoral level uh, with those that were prevailing at the end of last year. Uh, and so, wherever there is a dot above the 45 degree line, that means that indicates higher credit risk for that sector relative to the end of last year. And you can see there, uh, there is not a single dot uh, below the 45 degree line now. So that indicates that the risk of corporate sector downgrades and even defaults on a broad basis across the corporate sector uh, has, has, has taken a turn for the worse. It had been initially concentrated in, the, in those sectors that high, had higher energy use. And you can see that a lot of them are well above the 45 degree line, but it's now, it's, now it has been spreading. 
We go to the next slide. Uh, signs of financial stress are also servicing for households. Uh, less well-off households have been hit hardest, uh, of course, as we know, by the rise of food and energy prices. And they are also the gloomiest among income quintiles about their real income prospects. You can see that there on the left. Uh, so that, of course, uh, poses challenges for the debt that those for the, 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 the debt repayment capacities uh, of, of those households. And at the same time, it looks like the real estate cycle is also turning uh, as housing affordability is deteriorating. Uh, so that could compound the vulnerabilities of euro area households as high as, as our, our house price overvaluation measures now. Um, they are they stand at the highest levels that we have seen. Uh, in more than five years, and it's not because house prices have been rising further, but it's because mortgage interest rates have risen more rapidly uh, than house prices have adjusted. So against that background, uh, banks are are, are tightening uh, their mortgage lending standards, and you can see at the same time the prices of real estate investment trusts have fallen much further uh, than the broader stock market uh, on the right hand side, which is indicating a very pessimistic sentiment. On the, prof on the prospects for euro, for, for euro area residential real, real estate markets. So now I'm going to hand over to Tamara, who will show that this FSR is not all doom and gloom. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, John. So I'm going to, yeah, the, the, the brightest spot, but it's all relative, um, is in the banks. And as John mentioned at the start, um, the banking sector is step slightly uh, one step backstage and um, this this time round. So, I mean, in fact, with rising interest rates and widening margins, the sector has been performing rather well. As you can see in the left here, analyst expectations for profitability continue to improve actually quite sharply since the May FSR. And large banks have actually also been reporting their third quarter results in the last few weeks. And these have been even stronger in the first two quarters and another um, a round of uh, results ahead of market analyst expectations. Uh, net inc interest income has been a particularly strong component um, of that. Uh, and some of that may be temporary, though. Uh, the early Q3 data showed signs of quite a big role for corporate lending, which may fade. But we have seen this sustained pickup in net interest income. More significantly, though, um, we do have some concerns about the banking sector looking ahead, and that's a, a starts one of the, the biggest areas for that is around asset quality and whether or not banks um, will need to catch up a bit on provisioning as the economic cycle develops. You can see on the right here the cost of risk, although it's ticked up slightly in the blue line there, um, is still historically quite low. And based on past experience, we would expect it to rise in the period and head as the PMI declines, which is the, the yellow line here, it's inverted. In parallel to that, we've got NPL ratios that are also historically low. Banks have been doing a lot over the last decade to reduce those, but we are being seeing some signs of rising credit risks in stage two loan ratio, which has drifted up this year. And also behind that, um, analysis that indicates that more energy intensive firms uh, tend to be seeing a slightly bigger increase in PDs. So overall, we can't be complacent about the risks to banks and um, from asset quality and whether or not the benefits from net interest income will be sustained. But that said, with these headwinds for banks, another big positive, though, is that the resilience is starting, has a good starting point now, comparable with pre-pandemic levels and much better than ahead of the great financial crisis. So core equity tier one capital ratios have dropped slightly this year, but they remain around 15 percent. Um, and. And that's um, well ahead of the regulatory requirements. We also have leverage ratios that are hovering around uh, six percent for the sector. Although for GSIBs they are slightly lower at five percent, and we do see um, a declining uh, drift down in recent quarters, partly reflecting the expiration of some uh, regulatory exemptions that were offered during the pandemic period. So again. And the levels are currently looking good, but we probably would be, we definitely would be reluctant to see too much of a reduction to those. And that's a point that we pick out in the FSR um, where there are opportunities to retain capital um, before it's needed to support lending. That, that seems like a, a good opportunity. So before we wrap up, I wanted to give you an overview of our three special features in this issue of the FSR. 
I'll not be able to do them justice, but maybe it's um, it's enough of a taste to encourage you to go and um, and read them yourselves. The first uh, captured here looks at risks from energy derivatives markets. I'm sure many of you are aware these came into focus earlier this year as energy prices soared and some energy companies signaled that they were finding it difficult to meet cash margin requirements that followed from that. The speech uh, looks at what we see of how energy companies responded and pulls data that indicates that we do indeed have some evidence moving out of the centrally cleared space towards over the counter contracts, which you can see in the middle panel here. That implies um, moving out of the sort of safer and more heavily margined sector into something that's, um, that poses some more risks um, in, in, the, in a systemic stress because it would be harder to unwind all those contracts and they don't have all the um, safety measures that come with uh, central clearing. In parallel, um, firms also resorted to, we've got evidence that they switched exchanges. And um, again, perhaps looking at exchanges that had lesser or different margin requirements. And also that um, in order to meet the margin requirements they were facing, a lot of firms were drawing particularly on credit lines, which you can see in the right hand panel here. So again, perhaps pushing some firms um, into, to increase leverage and um, posing more risks. So overall, the piece pulls this together and it also does some assessments to look at um, how energy companies might fare if we were to see another bout of extreme volatility in energy markets and um, which have actually calmed down a bit in recent weeks. So if that was to return, we do think there could still um, be some risks present there. And it really highlights from our financial stability perspective, the value in looking at margining practices to improve transparency and also work that could support the liquidity preparedness of participants in derivatives markets. The second special feature takes on the issue of household income inequality and risks to financial stability. John um, sh showed you that in the current inflation squeeze, not everyone is facing this to the same degree and it disproportionately affects lower income households who spend a larger share of their income on energy and food prices, which have risen a lot. What this piece does is it brings together various survey and available bank lending data to try and look at um, what that might mean in terms of liquid or distressed households and who and how that could affect their own debt. And a very clear result comes out that indeed lower income households will face bigger squeeze. And as a result, we could see a significant increase in the um, number of uh, lower income households that fall into economic distress and could affect their own debtedness. Um, where we then also take it though is to the banking sector to look at what that might mean for the credit. And there, the news is a bit more sanguine for the system as a whole. So whilst distressing for these households individually, and that's an issue that should be taken seriously, for the banking sector, um, the, the share of these households in overall um, credit is smaller. And um, for example, they um, lower income households are less have less um, use of mortgage lending. They tend to have more consumer lending, it's smaller share and so on. So we've done some, uh, present some estimates of the impact it could have on NPL ratios after very extreme shocks. So kind of shocks assuming that every distressed household defaults entirely, for example, which is really a tail risk. And the numbers we find um, suggest a, a, a limited systemic risk overall, although it varies by country. I think for us, though, the other thing here is it, it opens up a new branch of analysis um, that we look at further. The third special feature um, is, um, and John will, will have a personal interest, this is one of the co-authors, um, brings to a topic that we've mentioned briefly in many FSRs, but this is the first time I think we've devoted as much space as this to the question of cyber risk. Um, cyber risk for us, I think we've, um, what the authors have done here is really um, looked at, first of all, the marked increase that we've seen more frequent and more severe um, uh, cyber attacks, but also done a lot to look at what this could mean for the financial system um, and, and, and how it might play out. In particular, analysis that suggests cyber attacks do not occur randomly. They, there is some evidence that they reflect um, identifiable factors that can include the economic strength. Um, the country but also um, has seemed to rise with economic uncertainty and that's something you can see in the middle panel here. Um, so, and, um, and also other factors such as um, the degree of financial globalisation. 
that also, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting and rich special feature that also looks at the role of uh, the interaction between cyber attacks and the crypto asset realm, where crypto assets seem to dominate um, uh, calls for payment um, uh, in response to cyber attack um, or threat of uh, crypto assets. So in a co uh, um, a, a correlation between the the two um, uh, between crypto assets and cyber risks. Uh, but then finally, um, we also uh, it also presents um, uh, quite a lot of work showing how far the data can take us at the moment, and where there are large data gaps in this uh, ch fast changing landscape, um, which I think the the authors set out in terms of how we need to improve monitoring and analytical frameworks so that policymakers can then look to how what parts of the toolkit need expanding in order to help manage these risks over time. That brings me to, I think, then the concluding slide. Um, as John said at the start, we've downgraded our financial stability assessment again, and this really is driven by macroeconomic developments, um, uh, which have uh, really, uh, sorry, <laughs> I just lost my train of thought, macroeconomic developments, which see upside risks to inflation, weaker risk to growth and tighter financial conditions, which could bring to pass exposing long-standing vulnerabilities in the system, possibly simultaneously. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, John and Tamara. I now hand over to Laurent for the discussion. Thank you, Ernest. So let me first uh, also thanks, uh, thank you and the SRA for, for your kind invitation to discuss this uh, FSR. And let me also take uh, this opportunity to thank uh, John, Tamara and their colleagues for their excellent uh, uh, review. Just to sum up uh, the key messages uh, from this uh, new uh, ECB's uh, financial stability review. So despite the the, the presentation by, by John and Tamara, the, the, I would say that uh, uh, the FSR provides uh, a quite gloomy perspective on, on financial stability in Europe. Um, the, the five key messages I, I drew and I agree with uh, from, the, from their presentation and uh, the, the review are the following. So first, uh, macroeconomic and financial uh, conditions further deteriorated since uh, this summer. So as John mentioned, it's the second downgrade uh, from of this FSR. Uh, at the same time, what we observed was uh, a tightening of financial conditions, which may increase the vulnerabilities of, or, or indebted sovereign as old and corporates. Uh, Tamara just presented the fact that it can affect uh, also uh, as old very differently, uh, taking into account their financial conditions. Um, the, the, the review also uh, highlights uh, the risk of disorderly market stress, uh, which can uh, rise amid higher volatility. And I think that's an important uh, aspect also, uh, potential further asset repricing. So uh, the, the review, for instance, uh, take, take, take into account the fact that risk premia have increased, but obviously they may not fully reflect the deterioration, the most recent deterioration of economic perspective. So by contrast with uh, other analysis, uh, I think uh, this, uh, uh, this review uh, put forward uh, an additional risk of uh, market repricing or correction. So that, that's something which is uh, an important aspect to take into account. Obviously, uh, in that context uh, of a weaker economy, uh, credit risk might increase and asset quality might also uh, deteriorate and that may weight on uh, bank profitability uh, over the, 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 the medium term. Uh, finally, and that's the, the last key message I, I noted, the, the FSR also points to persistent vulnerabilities in the non-bank financial sector and also uh, recurrent uh, liquidity challenges. So I will come, come uh, across these, uh, these, these features. So uh, if you can move to the next slide. So in order to, to discuss uh, this presentation, I, I will raise three, three questions and then uh, provide you with some uh, also insight from, from, from my side. So the first question is whether we are not back to a situation that we already experienced in the 70s. Uh, the current situation to some extent recalls that of uh, 1973. 
the first all price shock. So we are in a context of huge political uncertainty, um, a, a, a war era to quote the G20 uh, summary, but our, our war economy. Um, there is a massive supply shock, which is affecting uh, energy, commodity and food prices and the surge in inflation. So if you if you look at the level of inflation that we have observed uh, this year, I mean, these are levels that we have not observed over the past uh, 40, even 50 years in some countries. So that that is something which is uh, particularly striking uh, with an increase in risk premia and also uh, interest rates. And we, we started from negative interest rates, some, sometime far below zero, and we are now far, far above uh, far above zero. So. Uh, this means a significant deterioration of uh, financial condition. And in that context, obviously, and, and John and Tamara po pointed to that, there is an anticipated uh, uh, strong and negative impact on, on economic perspective. I drew from uh, their presentation and the FSR this uh, uh, striking figure, uh, which uh, shows that uh, if, we, if you believe in this kind of indicators, the, 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 the probability uh, risk uh, of a recession one year already, uh, and John pointed that the figure is, is almost reaching uh, 80%. Uh, to take a, a view on that, usually these kind of indicators, when they are above 40%, it's already uh, the fact that uh, you will face a, a recession. So 80% is something like uh, it's already there in a way. So if you, you can move to, to, to the next slide. So the, the, the second question is, um, about about the shock and and why uh, why uh, are we focusing on next year and not uh, this year? So coming back to to this year and it's quite paradoxical in a way. We we had a, a suite of uh, significant shocks. I, I, I even called them black swan to some extent because they were not foreseen and to to a size that was not anticipated. So a war an almost uh, market collapse or correction, uh, a surge in inflation, I, I recall the figures, a sharp increase in interest rates, uh, triggering heavy losses on, uh, on fixed income markets. So th this is something that, that was pretty strong. But, uh, but still, uh, the economy uh, resisted and uh, looking uh, across agent, it's fair to say that there, there was a, a lot of resilience. So if you look at the real sector for both as old and firms, uh, they, they quite uh, resisted well and to some extent uh, absorbed the shock. But obviously, like uh, what we experience in the COVID crisis, they, there are different situations across sectors and, and countries, especially for those who are relying on, on uh, a lot on, ed on energy. Uh, so for those, for those ones, the, the shock is, is really uh, sizable. In that context, what we have observed also is that uh, default rates have increased to some extent, but not com commensurately to the shock. And so they still remain uh, well below the pre-COVID level. Um, so that's, that's something which is remarkable. Unemployment has remained broadly stable. Uh, that, that's also uh, an important aspect. What I noted also, uh, which was a bit surprising, was the extent to which firms were able to, uh, in a way, accommod accommodate the inflationary shock by providing this year substan substantial wage increases. So, um, uh, to my recollection, it was, uh, we, we have not noted such uh, important wage increases over the, the past uh, decades, I would say, uh, two decades almost. So uh, that, that was very useful in a way because uh, not only uh, the, the firm were able to do that because they were cash rich to some extent, but they, they have also moderated the, the fall in real disposable income, which uh, might have a, 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 a huge impact on, on the macroeconomy. Uh, uh, another factor which pr probably uh, helped to uh, help to, to 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 in a way uh, fix the situation is the context uh, of a fixed rate prevailing in Europe for for both uh, as old and to to a large extent to to corporates, so that uh, the sharp increase uh, in in uh, interest rate uh, has not uh, led so far to uh, an increase in debt services. And finally, and that was pointed out by Tamara uh, in particular, financial institutions 
and in particular bank, banks and also insurance companies uh, have, have uh, kept uh, their good result. I mean, there, there is a lot of inertia. Uh, credit provision was uh, still uh, very dynamic this year. And uh, both sectors could uh, benefit also from, uh, from interest rate increases. So overall, in a way, the, the system and the real economy were able to, to absorb the shock. Obviously, the, the concern now is, is about 2023. And, and obviously, that, that, that the, the reasons are the following, and they were uh, highlighted by both uh, John and Tamara. So uncertainty uh, has not disappeared, and it, it remains, and it may increase even in the short term. Uh, we, are, we observe this deterioration in both uh, macroeconomic and market indicators, and, and they presented a lot of, the, of those indicators. Perhaps, and I will come back to that, uh, markets have been experiencing a growing liquidity shortage, and, and that is a, a real cause for concern. And what we are noting also by the end of this year, especially for, for banks, but also in general for, for financial institutions, it's, it's the, the current uh, difficulty that they are confronted with uh, in, in, uh, in funding their activity for next year. So usually they are used to front load their funding, but this year, because of the situation on financial market, they, are, they have delayed their, their funding, and they are currently facing, uh, I think, deteriorated market condition, especially for those who may need uh, also additional needs, uh, especially, I think it, is, it was also pointed out in the, the review, those who are facing uh, MREL uh, shortfalls. So the question is, uh, obviously, uh, with respect to the figure that was presented whether a recession next year is almost certain or whether it remains uh, conditional given the uncertainty. And here I, I would like to make a parallel with the COVID crisis because we were faced with an uncertainty shock and obviously uh, the, the materialization of the risk did not happen to the extent that was anticipated. So for instance, we were talking about a tsunami of default that never occurred. So the question is whether the, the situation is as gloomy as depicted or, or whether uh, the, we need also to take into account the, the policy responses and the, the resilience of actors. So if we, we can move to, to the next slide. Uh, as far as the policy responses are concerned, I think that perhaps uh, uh, there is a, an important aspect in this diagnosis, which is to disentangle between intended effect and unintended effects. And the reason is that uh, the context in which uh, this uh, di diagnosis takes place is a context where we have uh, already uh, both monetary policy and macroprudential policy tightening. Um, so the the and and I noted also that in in the FSR, uh, although it is very prudent uh, with that respect, but the ECB is is calling for further preemptive actions. Uh, so meaning that there are still the possibility to do that from the the macro prudential perspective. So uh, and, and in, indeed many uh, many authorities, including France, are, are still considering uh, further action. Uh, in that context. So obviously uh, it means that uh, authorities, uh, the ECB, uh, national authorities, when they are tightening their policies, they are considering the trade-offs and obviously they are balancing the risk of being uh, pro-cyclical. So, uh, and in that context, we, we take note, and, and I think that, that, that is also what the ECB said in the context of these uh, policy, monetary policy decision, that there is also uh, additional steps which are needed uh, to dampen uh, inflation risk and to, um, to anchor in inflation expectations. So, in a way, part of the cooling down of the economy, which was reflected in, uh, in, in the presentation of uh, John and Tamara, is intended in, in this context of uh, monetary policy and macroprudential policy tightening. And I would say that uh, authorities are, are taking care of that. So if we take into account, for, ex for instance, uh, the issue of quantitative uh, tightening, which is uh, taking place now, uh, and, and which is driven, for instance, by the decline in TLT arrows. So the, these are take, uh, done at a pace uh, which are not only anticipated, but also to a large extent controlled by, by banks. 
therefore with limited uh, expected impact on, on financial co con condition. So now, if we if we look at, at the un unintended effect, and and, uh, and 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 obviously they are likely, but they, they will stem from additional shocks. So the one which which precisely are not necessarily uh, anticipated. So these are uh, new shocks on energy or commodity uh, prices, further disruption in, in the supply chain, uh, perhaps also the the inability of Europe to cope with the energy crisis and a deepening uh, of uh, geo geopolitical risk. There is another aspect I, I already alluded to that, uh, which is related to market and, and, and liquidity risk. And there, I would agree with the ECB uh, that there is still a, a potential for market correction when we, you look uh, at uh, a stretch valuation on, on some asset markets. So if you can move to the next slide. So in that context, so there are two aspects. There are still factors of resilience, uh, and I, I think they are important. So uh, obviously, they, they will depend on the capacity of actors to withstand the, the shock. So as, we, as I said, and as we have seen so far, uh, so good for firms as all banks and insurance companies. So that is due to uh, also previous policy support, but also uh, to solid balance sheets and to cushions also, uh, for instance, as, as, old, uh, as old still have a, a lot of saving, so they, they can in a way accommodate for the shock. Uh, obviously, there is this issue of uh, distribution that was pointed at by Tamara, but uh, that's an important aspect. And we still have this issue uh, uh, the, this uh, factor of resilience, which is uh, related to the fact that uh, debt has been uh, uh, taken on, on, on the base of fixed rate. Uh, so that, that uh, these factors are, of resilience are also consistent with uh, uh, declining NPL up to the, the, the end of the second qu quarter of 2022. Uh, and as it was pointed out, uh, so not in the presentation, but it's clearly highlighted in, in the FSR, there is, there is however, uh, uh, a decline in asset quality and an increase in credit risk, which is uh, reflected by, uh, by a significant share of exposures, which are moving into uh, IFRS stage two. So, uh, and here the question is whether uh, banks provision will be sufficient to, to accommodate for this increase in, in, in the risk. Uh, there is the issue of the strength of inflation, but um, if, if, you, if you look at uh, most of the forecasts, it is expected to peak at the end of this year. So the, the remaining challenge is whether there are still uh, or there will be persistence in the spillovers to, to the core component. And these are mostly due to the, to the la lack defect of, of wage negotiation. And obviously, there, there, among the factor of resilience, there, there is also the, the policy response and the adaptation of both uh, monetary and fiscal policy. And, and if we can move to the last slide, so there, there are obviously cause for concern, and here I will join uh, the ECB, so they, they, they are related first to, to the macroeconomic outlook. And here it's fair to say that the ba balance of risk is still uh, tilted to the downside, uh, at least in Europe. And as I said, the, the other concern is about uh, market and liquidity risk. So in the review, uh, there is a, a special features uh, on, on energy market that is worth to read. But you can make also the, the parallel with what happened in the UK gilt market. Uh, so here yeah, the, 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 the fact is that these two episodes uh, can illustrate that there is still a scope for uh, heightened volatility on, on, on markets. And the fact that uh, both of them are also illustrating uh, diminishing liquidity uh, on, on some aspects. Uh, and here I, I would also uh, join uh, uh, their analysis and their concern about the uh, NBFI sector. And I, what I would like to point out, perhaps something that was not done, uh, that was, was not done in the FSR, which is uh, the persistence of uh, risky behavior. So, uh, and I think that the UK recent episode uh, is, is, uh, is illustrated of that. So despite uh, the fact that we have engaged in, in a lot of regulation over the past uh, decades uh, and even more, there are still uh, some form of uh, bad incentive or, or bad management, uh, which, which are in a way, which have not disappeared in a way. So they are related to the combination of uh, short-term financing through um, 
and, and leverage on repo market, uh, you know, where wrong grade, wrong grade risk and uh, an, appropriate, an inappropriate use of their derivative. And also, uh, but, but the fact and the key difference is that it's not uh, happening on the toxic asset or something, something which are not really uh, transparent, but on, on plain vanilla uh, assets or instruments. So that, that is the cause for concern. And it is also illustrating uh, something that was uh, perhaps uh, theoretically highlighted, but which has been uh, experience of uh, these two episodes, which is the issue of uh, the procyclicality in margin calls and its scope for contagion in particular uh, on uh, underlying collateral markets. And that's it for me. And, and thanks a lot, uh, John and, and Tamara for your, your presentation. Thank you very much, Laurent. I would suggest that um, I combine a few questions which we have from the chart. Let me just look at them. How do you interpret the rise in the euro area systemic risk composite indicator, mostly stock and bond market components? And how do you use it for policy making is one question that we received. Another one that we have is, can you comment on risk differences between countries with mainly floating rate or short term fixed lending markets? with those mainly using longer fixed rates. And if I may add three further questions to this, I took these along from various market newsletters and recent discussions with banks and, and asset managers. So the first question is, there seems to be some discussion about what some observers call a forthcoming liquidity hole. Now, this, this is not particularly for the euro area, but globally, and the argument goes, government financing needs that are coming forward because of the energy crisis and so on. The uh, start of central banks of QT on the one hand, and then in the euro area, the expiration of the big Teltro tranche in mid of next year. So this might create a liquidity hole. So what your view is on this from a financial pers uh, stability perspective. The second theme that I came across was are we already sort of in a disorderly energy transition? And what implications would this have? How much uh, are the insights from existing climate stress tests, which might be relevant here? And the third issue, which is very much discussed in various fora is the theme of polycrisis. So there the idea is that various shocks happen at the same time but they are not additive but they relate with each other and uh, there might even be strong non-linearities so that they reinforce each other and it would be interesting to know to what extent work in the ecb has started to cope with such issues so five questions uh, please select whatever you feel appropriate and laurent also feel free to answer thank you well i make a make a start um actually let me take the, the, the easiest one first the question on the case the, the technical question actually i think that what that shows really reflects what we're talking about about a broad-based asset market correction a big a big the, the case is measuring volatility in financial markets but it's also reflecting correlation uh, across financial markets and the, the correlation component this common decline that i showed where both bond and stock prices are falling at the same time. This we have not seen very often um, in the past. And that is, what, that is what that is reflecting, the correlation. And I think that's true both for, yeah, both for the, the, the sovereign and the market-based one. Uh, the fixed versus floating, I mean, it's a great question. Um, you know, which, which systems prove more resilient? I mean, in part, is it kind of, a, you know, reflects culture, maybe risk, you know, choices about, um, how risks are are, are, di are distributed. I mean, I think regardless of which system you have, um, you know, it's just that the risks and, you know, the, the risks are shifted from one place to another. Uh, so, and, and then the question is, you know, which sector is better, has the better capacity of managing the risks. So if you have fixed rate, if you have a tradition of fixed rate mortgages, um, that means that the, the, the housing, that the household sector is protected from interest rate risk, at least for as long as they have the fixed element in the contract. Uh, and it passes the risk to the banks. So, I mean, I think most people would think that, that, that financial institutions are better at ma managing financial risks than, than, than households are. I think that's what 
yeah, many argue. Um, but you can if you reverse it and you have yeah, floating, then it's the, then it's the households, of course, that are having to manage that are having to manage the risks. And of course, and you see those stresses appearing earlier, of course, because um, people are seeing it passing through into their in, into their in, 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 you know into their monthly mortgage into their monthly mortgage bills. I'm not sure really where the conclusion is on on which one is better. Um, I maybe I just I'd love to, I, Narong, your your discussion was fantastic. I mean, was very very rich. I mean, I think you really asked. You know, each of the three questions that you asked could be a seminar topic of its own. I I think you know. I mean, comparing today uh, with the 1970s. I mean, I know it, it's very tempting to make, and I agree. I mean, we had this a big big supply shock in the 70s, but we had a lot of other things going on as well. We had the breakdown of Bretton Woods. We had. I don't know. There was. I, I know. I can think of positives and negatives. We had much more fiscal space, um, probably in the 1970s. Um, I think energy intensity, at least in in the developed world, would have been would have been higher then than it is today because we've got a, a bigger services sector. So I don't know where <clears throat> I don't know where the answer would be um, on this comp comparison of of 22 versus 23 and the black swans and all of that. I mean, I think this is going to. Yeah, the tsunami of defaults never came, but I think you were in a way answering your own questions by saying, "Well, we had a big policy response uh, in, you know, in, in, in a COVID policy response." And I think, you know, I, I, I think it's not controversial to say we could not expect a policy response and such a broad-based and forceful policy response again with what we're heading into now. And this is where maybe your last part on on resilience and all of those factors. By the way, I mean, I think it's important to balance that there are many, many positive factors of resilience, both in the financial sector um, and in the real economy, the strength of the labor market and so on, and all of those, all of those points that you made. But I think that there's a danger, you know, that we, you know, that we fall into a complacency. Um, I call it, you know, let's not be fooled by, let's not be fooled by resilience that just because we were able to absorb all of those shocks, that we should then start thinking that we would be able to absorb the next ones because there were these special things there were these special things that happened. I mean, and then in addition, I, I think that there may be parts of the financial system where we're not really sure. Um, you know, we know that resilience has been, ero has been eroded gradually through all of these losses. Those losses exist in the system somewhere. Maybe some of it, you know, where do those investment funds sell those assets? Who, who bought those assets from those investment funds? Hopefully, if it went outside of the system, of course, that's great news. But I'm not sure that that is the case. And then, you know, where is it, and and and, and is it is it in a in a part of the financial system that would be able to that would be able to absorb the shock? So, in a way, and I think you spoke about nonlinearities. You know, I think what's the best metaphor for that? For that, the straw that breaks the camel's back. We don't know what the straw is, um, but we know that there may be. You know, I mean, experience tells us um, from the past that you know things will pop up. Uh, where they are least expected. Maybe on the thing, on last thing on the post cyclicality of, of, of macro pro, I think it's a really important point. There is a little bit of space on macro pro, not much. Um, this whole point about, yeah, I mean, I think the, the pro cyclicality. So, by, by, for 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 colleagues who were who have joined us, uh, who are not used to our lingo in this respect, I mean, what that means is you don't want to take a, we don't want to take the policy action, the macro potential policy side that would actually cause or aggravate the crisis or make the economic. Adjustment even more difficult. So, uh, you know, what can we do to avoid that? Well, I mean, I think some of the things that we've said it in the review. There, there are some banking systems uh, where capital is well above uh, the requirements, and you know, we just think it would be it would be safer if banks kept that capital. Especially now, I mean, in, in the past we we worried about low interest rates and that forcing banks to keep capital. Um, was risking that they would be forced into investing in activities that wouldn't be profitable. And I think we may have even been seeing that in the low interest rate environment. And this might have been an, a, one expert, explanatory factor for why we had very low price book ratios. But now with interest rates being higher, I think the risk of that happening is lower. And so, you know, the argument that would strengthen the argument for, you know, have, you know, <clears throat> exercising policy prudence that banks retain capital through what is potentially going to be a very challenging period. Tamara, do you have anything to add? Not much. I think John covered anything. I think on your, maybe just on your question, Ernest, at the end, you sort of brought it back to, which I think the FSR really gets to is you've got multiple policymakers all facing difficult problems. 
at the moment and how are these things going to get along with each other rather than conflict with each other i think was the heart of your <laughs> yeah. of your question and i think we we're alive to that what i will say is i think we're pretty clear in the fsr that actually and the vice president actually said it this morning getting price stability back on track is going to help financial stability everything's worse for financial stability if inflation doesn't get under control right and i think we're pretty clear on that what I think our analysis in the FSR hopefully helps support our colleagues having the debate about the start of QT to say, but look, here's the things we need to be alive to as you make your decisions on the modalities, on the different schemes and exactly how you proceed. Here's something to bear in mind um, in that approach, particularly because on some of it, we've got limited experience. We've got limited experience on what QT will mean. In fact, we've got no experience on what that's going to look like. Um, and we're doing it in the context of really quite high inflation, like inflation that's not in most of our data sets and definitely not in the euro area data set. So there's a lot of thinking it through, making sure that we're being honest and open about the situation that we see in front of us. But these are not easy problems right now. Um, but I think there's a lot of people thinking, so hopefully we can dance our way through it um, without and avoid the, the cliffs. Great. Thank you, Tamara. Laurent, you, you, you have the opportunity for a final word. Yes, so thank you. I, I, I like the, the question you raised at the end about the, this uh, risk, which are uh, in a way compounding and not necessarily being ad additive. So I think that's the challenge that uh, John and Tamara are facing every day, <laughs> in a way, uh, just looking at uh, the reasons for why uh, interest rates are, are increasing. You have both uh, an increase in inflation expectation, uh, uh, or the reflection of uh, real growth anticipation, uh, an increase in risk premia, and 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 you already there have a, a full story of uh, things happening on, on the market and the real economy. So I think uh, that's the beauty of uh, of, of uh, having uh, financial uh, stability reviews uh, updated uh, and done in in this uh, professional way by uh, by the ECB. So I think it's uh, it's. Uh, it's a key, uh, an ongoing story, but uh, that's uh, it's the, the challenge and the beauty of our of our work. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, it's a, it's a safe job, and we all have subscriptions to this financial stability review. <laughs> so <laughs> I think uh, this is a good conclusion to today's Swerve Buffett Bocconi webinar on the November 2022 ECB FSR. Thank you so much, John, Tamara, and Laurent for sharing your insights with us and for your open uh, presentation of the, of the key problems uh, at hand. Thank you all for participating and for your interesting questions in the chat. Thank you all. Bye-bye and take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day.